Hello, everybody. We're, we're trying to do something a little bit complicated tonight with uh, Zoom and Susan Greer, who's down in Toronto, is going to do a presentation um, on natural burial. Um, and as usual, before these things get going, we have a couple of announcements. BPEG is going to have uh, an annual general meeting on May the 3rd. <laughs> My brain. Um, yeah, so we're going to have an AGM on May the 3rd. It's been a long time since we've got an AGM because of COVID. Um, but we just want you to know that that is coming up. We want to revitalize the organization post pandemic. Uh, we're starting to have monthly meetings again. And we're going to put out a financial appeal to people to pay their membership dues. Um, the other thing that's going to happen before the AGM, though, is that we're going to do an Earth Day um, event on April the 22nd, which is a Saturday. Um, and it's probably going to be up at the Lindsay Tract. So stay tuned. We're going to get information out about that. Um, we have had a long time getting through the pandemic. We really think that BPEG plays an important role in the community and we want to make sure it can continue. So we will be looking for people interested in helping keep it going. You, you must appreciate that the board that's sat on the organization through the pandemic has been doing it for quite a while now. And it's time to ask for some serious help from our members. So now I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Susan Greer, who is working for the Natural Burial Association of Ontario. I, hello, I, I love your part of the world. It's so beautiful there. I wish so badly I could be there in, in person, um, but I can't, but I am, just as thrilled to present any information that you may not know about natural burial here from my little screen. So I guess I'm just gonna assume that, unless I hear otherwise, Rod, if there is a problem, I do have my phone here, you know my phone number. I'm gonna keep on going. So I will tell you what natural burial is because there's lots of people who don't know what it is and why people like it. That is a little bit more uh, intricate than you might think. Who likes it? And then there, of course, is a difference between natural burial and natural burial grounds. We'll go through that. And um, our little efforts towards government regulations, I think, might be of interest to you. I'm going to start by playing this video. It just really encapsulates what natural burial is and what the Natural Burial Association is all about. If we told you your death could protect the earth and nurture new life, would you believe it? With natural burial, it can. Natural burial is one of the most eco-friendly ways of caring for our dead. Without the use of chemical embalming, we are laid to rest in a biodegradable casket or wrapped in a shroud, and our body contributes to the earth's renewal. Natural burial grounds aren't at all like modern cemeteries. Rather than a manicured lawn with rows of tombstones, Imagine a quiet forest or a wild meadow. Graves are marked by simple stones, native plants, or a communal dedication. However commemorated, the location of every grave is recorded. The people who run natural burial grounds ensure the land is restored and protected in its natural ecosystem. Right, yeah. You might think, isn't cremation eco-friendly? Not at all. The body is incinerated at about 800 degrees Celsius yeah, in two me? hours, and carbon dioxide is emitted into the atmosphere. You might worry that scavengers will dig us up. Oh, we okay. are buried too oh, deep okay. for scavengers. We feed the soil, okay. not okay. the wildlife. Nor do we harm the water. Just like modern cemeteries, natural burial grounds are regulated. We're often asked if natural burial is legal. Absolutely. Before funerals became commercialized, natural burial was the way many of our ancestors cared for their dead. And to this day, several faiths uphold the tradition. At natural burial grounds, we're invited to participate in the ceremony by laying the body to rest 
filling in the grave, and decorating it. One guest wrote, everyone who attended has stated a desire to be buried here. The whole experience was perfect in every way. With nature as our teacher, being in its midst helps us see death as part of life. There is solace in knowing our loved one's last act is giving back to the earth. Today, there are hundreds of natural burial grounds worldwide, started by people with compassion for the planet and the families they serve. In Tennessee, Larkspur Conservation spans 112 acres of diverse forest and meadow. Every burial is an act of healing. In one of England's national parks is South Downs Natural Burial Site, where each grave is dug by hand to minimize environmental impact and to respect the area's tranquility. In BC, Catherine Valentine and Gavin Johnston created Salt Spring Island Natural Cemetery. As current stewards of the land, their mission is to restore the forest to one of giant Douglas firs. Salt Spring is Canada's only public natural burial ground that stands alone in nature, not attached to a modern cemetery. In Ontario, some cemeteries have sectioned off a natural burial area, but we believe our province is capable of bigger, wilder possibilities. Expansive sites that protect Ontario's beauty and offer people a final resting place in nature. The Natural Burial Association, a nonprofit organization independent of the funeral industry, aims to bring this option to Ontarians so we can choose to leave a legacy of nature. Please lend your voice, share this video, and follow us on social media. Okay, that has some nice images to help you conjure up what a, the, the, imagine what a natural burial ground is all about. And I'll take you through what the tenets of natural burial are. Um, it truly is, um, for those that are looking at their end-of-life options through an environmental lens, the most environmentally friendly way of caring for our dead. It's also the only way in which it's not a process. There's no, there's no industrial involvement at all. It is just giving our body back to earth. So the body is buried in a biodegradable casket or a shroud without embalming or without a vault or a grave liner. At a natural burial ground, the body is buried um, it's, it's at a shallower depth. It's at about three and a half feet. And that's where all that rich microbial activity takes place in the soil. So it just allows our body to really contribute back um, to the soil. And also in a natural burial ground, there's fewer plots per acre. So it just does, does less, ham, less harm to the environment. At a conventional cemetery, you can have about 1,200 um, burials in one acre. And so in a natural burial ground, it's like at least half of that, if not more. Or if not less. And, and then, so that is what happens below ground. Above ground, the tombstones are replaced by a modest flat stone or a communal marker. And creativity inspires a whole bunch of other neat things that can take place at the natural burial grounds. There can be um, apiaris and their beehive, trails, bird watching, art classes, um, the little school kids come in and, pl and plant the wildflower plugs. There's so many neat things that can be done to help you form that connection between the nature and the people, both living and dead. And of course, one of the most important mandates of a natural burial ground, the land is protected and restored in its natural eco habitat. So there's none of the mowing, none of the pesticides and none of those you know, rows of, of tombstones. I should say that if uh, every cemetery is different, they all have their own bylaws. But if an, let's say there's a natural burial ground and some of them don't um, have any memorial markers, one can always, always find their loved one. It's, it's part of the law. Natural burial grounds follow the same law that any other um, cemetery does in Ontario. And using GPS or a little uh, metal detector, there's always a way of finding one's loved one. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about um, 
You know what? I'm going to turn off the phone, Rod, because I can hear my echo here. It's, I think everything's good, technically speaking. Um, um, so I'll tell you about um, the perceptions of, of natural burial. We did a we did some research in Ontario only with over a thousand individuals of all ages, of all like a cross section of different rural and urban centers throughout the province at various educational levels. It's like, you know, Angus and Reed knows how to take the perfect sampling of a of a um, Ontario cross section. And we asked them who who's heard of awareness who who knows about natural burial or, or green burial as it's often called and um over half the population this was done last january 2022 hadn't even heard of it some of it had heard of the name um but then when we described it to them the the reaction was incredibly positive people really really liked the idea and would they consider it you can see the numbers there it's so like over 70 percent definitely or probably would consider it and when people know about it it really resonates and on the right hand side you see that be wild even in death we have um a social media campaign out right now to build awareness of natural burial and that is one of the posts that have have gone out there and the and the feedback is just unbelievably beautiful. Like, you know, oh my gosh, I didn't know this existed or I didn't know it was legal and this is so wonderful. So, you know, when it, when it gets to, when we're thinking about um, the end goal here, having a hybrid or a dedicated site in the Lion's Head or the Bruce Peninsula in general, um, know that this is something that is not niche. This is a big deal for a lot of people. And to hammer that point home, I, I, I wanna break down the stereotype that this is not a tree hugger initiative. There might be many of you in the room for whom natural burial appeals because it means that the, you know, our last act is gentle to, to the earth. But it's, it's, there's a lot of different reasons why people like natural burial. And I'll actually take you through those reasons. But, um, uh, we did the survey, as I mentioned, January before the last election. And so people had um, also indicated what party they were going to vote for. And so if, if this, I think this just reiterates, I mean, the, you know, the cons for instance, the Conservative Party is not really aligned with being environmental. Yet there's a lot of people within the Conservative Party that really, really appreciate the idea of natural burial. So I think that's great. And that's something that we can take to the stakeholders. That is, this is not a niche product or a niche want. This is something that has a wide appeal to a wide range of people. And, and this is the, what we've been hearing over the years about why people like it. It's um, their final act is giving back to the earth. That, that resonates with a lot of people. And, or that they rest in nature. They, they talk about how they will be at one with nature or that their family can come and visit in a natural setting. Um, certainly a lot of people do like that it's an environmental alternative to cremation and conventional burial, which of course are not good for the environment. And, and for many, um, depending on their faith, their, their background, it is the tr traditional approach. I mean, natural burials um, exist today for the Jewish and Muslim communities and um, were the way that there are many of us who would have had families that would have buried in this um, traditional way. It just in, started in the Civil War and then thing, in the U.S. Civil War and then things got um, more and more um, if you want to say advanced, and then there was an industry that formed to sort of take the care of the dad um, and the commercialization out of it, out of the home. Um, some, especially we hear from gardeners saying, of course, I want to be naturally buried. I'm a gardener and this is part of the cycle of life. So that's another reason. Um, and that our presence, when you opt to be buried in a natural burial ground, because of the rules with the cemeteries, it does mean that you are protecting nature in perpetuity. So some really like the idea that they're leaving a legacy for future generations. And of course, the last reason why people like it is it's simply not, it's natural and that they like that. Um, a lot of people are very surprised to hear that cremation isn't eco-friendly because of course it's always been positioned that way because it is relative to conventional burial with the embalming and the and the concrete vaults and the and the hardwood caskets. Um, and today, seventy percent of Ontarians opt for cremation. In BC, it's ninety percent. So BC is pretty much a trendsetter. We can, you know, perhaps that's the the trend that's going to be coming this way. 
Um, but it does, for those of you who are interested to know about cremation from an environmental perspective, it does release a, release a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. And uh, the other, there are other toxins that get into the atmosphere. There are some incinerators that might have a filter. It's a very, very expensive filter. So like, I think it's over a million dollars. So not a lot of the um, crematoriums have them, but if the incinerator has it, it can capture some of the toxics, but there's a lot, certainly the, the carbon gets up no matter what. Um, and, um, and that also when it comes to burying or scattering the um, cremated remains, it, it, it is both too sweet and too salty for the earth. So it does, it does hurt the soil and the foli foliage around it. Um, it's got a high alkaline pH level. Um, if there's any gardeners in the group of 11.8, it means nothing to be what I'm told that's very, very high. Um, and the sodium content um, is also extremely high for the plant and the, and the tree roots. Um, when we talk about natural burial, we. We, these are the questions, like the top questions that always surface, and I'll share them with you. Will natural burial poison the water? No, the pathogens die when we die. There are some exceptions like Ebola, and I forget the official name for mad cow disease, but those are two diseases in which special care has to be taken, and it could be that one cannot have a, have a burial, but those are very rare. Um, and otherwise, diseases die when we do it. There's no transmission of any disease. Um, through the soil, through the water. Um, and, and that is, again, you know, we're not hearing stories about disease coming out of um, the natural burial grounds that exist today, Jews, Jewish cemeteries, Muslim cemeteries. And then those people that also might not even know they're buried naturally, but they opted not to be embalmed and they opted for a simple pine box. They are in essence being buried naturally and are doing no damage. Scavengers will not eat us. Um, they were below the smell line. They're just, they're just simply not, not interested in us. There's no evidence of any um, scavenger threats to the natural burial grounds. Um, and, you know, you have that wonderful advocate for natural burials, Stuart Burgess in, in your community. And we've got a conversation about winter burials before. This is something that is um, tricky. It's, um, it's on our radar as a natural burial association. There are some communities, and I think you're, this is one of them. Um, Stuart, correct, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I haven't seen Stuart, but I'm assuming he's there somewhere. Um, that um, there are some communities, or even you can have one community with two cemeteries, and one will offer a winter burial, and one won't. So it's not dictated on the winter. Thunder Bay offers um, natural offers um, burials. 52 weeks of the year. So it can be done. It's just, it's an industry that's not too open to change. It might have some financial implications, but that's something we really want to do because you don't want for someone to really feel at comfort, at peace with their decision to have, to want to go with natural burial. They die in January. And then there's that trauma for the family of not being able to have them buried um, and, and at the time in which they would, they would wish. Um, I spoke to it earlier, but even if there's no more marker on a natural burial ground, absolutely, you can always find out where your loved one is. There's various means to do that. Uh, people also ask about the price of a natural burial. All the prices are set by the individual cemetery. As a general rule, we usually indicate that um, natural burial is, of course, much less uh, expensive than a conventional burial, but um, maybe more expensive than a uh, than a, a cremation it depends to how far the, the one has to go for, for a cremation there are here's some lovely pictures of natural burial grounds around the world all of these are natural burial grounds even with the deer um and there's just we just don't have them in canada and you know in ontario the way that we um do in other parts of the world and there are two kinds of natural burial grounds. I think today, we'll, as we get on uh, how we can help um, Bruce Peninsula Alliance said, we'll speak more to hybrids. But from the video, you saw that there's two kinds of natural burial grounds. And the hybrids are those, it's a, it's a small section that's um, created within a conventional cemetery. They range from uh, the first one in Ontario was in Coburg, and that was a quarter of an acre. And the biggest one now is in Niagara Falls, and that's two acres. And there's tons of them um, 
in the pipeline in the works. So there will be more. Um, the advantage to those is that it's nice that they can they can be in urban centers, and it also means that people can be buried clo very closer to their homes. The second kind of natural burial ground, and you saw a lot of those in the video, is called a dedicated site. Those are usually created by people um, or organizations outside of the industry. They're people that it's really, it's like a calling. They're looking at people, planet, and profit. The three Ps is often spoken of in um, this kind of enterprise. And they can be anywhere from five to a hundred acres. And they're of course all very rural. So in Ontario, this is a slide I took from another presentation and I used to have four examples on, but I took off one because there was a couple of consumer complaints about it. Um, but here's some examples of Willow's Rest I just mentioned in Niagara Falls. They have the, the they have like the school groups come in and plant the wildflower plugs. They have um, a artisan who took a dead ash tree and carved a beautiful, beautiful bench out of it. Um, they have the apiaris. It's just very, very beautiful there. Um, Glenwood Cemetery in the middle, that's in Picton, and that's Ontario's only woodland uh, burial ground. It's beautiful. The day I went to visit, there was a deer staring at me. It was just stunningly beautiful. And it's really, really hard to see where the burials are. It's a very small, discreet uh, metal marker. You, you wouldn't even see them. And there's families that are coming as far as Ottawa to, to be buried in Picton. And um, my understanding is that it's almost near full, but Union Cemetery in Coburg, it's small, but it, if you feel like you're at one with nature because behind it is um, a creek and a um, conservation burial ground. So it, it feels more like you're in nature than um, a quarter of an acre would lead you to believe. And there the, the, it's a father-son team that run the cemetery and they dig the graves by hand. They pull out the invasive species by hand. It's very, very beautiful. But there's so many now. It really is taking off. And so to get a list of the hybrids and... Um, what's in the works, I really encourage you to go to our website and uh, you'll see the page on Ontario and you'll see all the listings there. Um, I will show, cause it's so beautiful. Um, this is the one dedicated natural burial ground. We only have one in all of Canada. We actually have two, but one is, um, one is only for those that live on the island, but the one that's open to the public is um, run by these two people here, Kathy and Gavin, you can see their picture. And they live on a farm in Salt Spring Island and you drive up this windy road past their animals and their farmhouse. And then it, and it, and then it turns into deep forested area with tall, tall, tall Douglas firs and ferns and it's just beautiful and that's where they've created a natural burial ground you can see a burial taking place there a shroud burial it's very 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 beautiful and there's just some other examples of natural burial grounds um, in the U.S. and the U.K. there that if you wanted to see more of those are on our website also under about natural burial um, I am going to mention one thing um, which ties into the work that we're doing. The Natural Burial Association, we're here uh, headquartered, so to speak, I mean, in, in Toronto. And we really, we don't even reach out to the, the cemeteries asking for a natural burial ground in our, with the, the crazy way that real estate is in Toronto, I, we assume the answer would be no. So it, really our role is to help the communities like yours um, get the natural burial grounds off the ground, so to speak. <laughs> And, and break down any barriers um, that get in the way of having affordable burial. Because so many people, they write into us, and I love this idea, it's so natural and, and it will be affordable. And they do assume it will be affordable and it should be affordable. But what happens is there is a law in Ontario, and there's, it's the same law in many provinces actually, um, where if you buy a cemetery plot, let's say it costs $1,000. In Ontario, 40% of that plot price has to be stashed away in what's called the care and maintenance fund. Then that, that capital can never ever been, be touched. Only the interest off that can be touched in order to take care of the cemetery in perpetuity. It's a wonderful idea. Um, 
it, there's many provinces that have it and many, many states that have it. The difference is that Ontario, that rate is 40%. The national average is 13%. In the US, all the cemeteries are like 10 or 15%. It's, it's, I don't know how it got so high, but it's crazy because it hugely inflates the price of, of a burial. And one of the reasons that we're upset about it, because there's no reason to have that for a natural burial, because of course, with burial, a, a, a conventional cemetery, the costs to maintain it are number one, it's the mowing of the lawn, which has to be done every two weeks in the in the growing season. And then you take the whippersnipper and you have to go around the tombstones. And then you have to do this, like a, I think it's called the push test to make sure that the tombstones aren't falling over. So that's a lot of expense, the three greatest expense none of which are relevant for natural burial ground. So we've had our first meeting with the ministry and we're really trying hard to see if they can create a category of, of for natural burial grounds in which the percentage is 20%. Um, uh, yeah, just so, you, yeah, we're all, just so you know, we're all volunteers. I mentioned like really looking up for all the, the different um, regions around Ontario. There are a number of groups um, and some are more formal with websites and Facebook uh, pages and, and, and companies that have to have AGMs and others are just, you know, one or two people advocating for natural burial in their community. But we're trying to lower the fees. We have a partnership with a, with a charitable organization. So we're able to accept donations. And with that money, because we're all volunteers, we don't need the money, but we just turn it right around and start to do advertising campaigns to put, put up the word about this opportunity of natural burial. And that's really working. Um, and uh, I mentioned winter burials were, to be honest, we haven't figured out how, but we've got to fight this winter burial. There's no reason why it, it shouldn't be available. And municipal approvals, just a lot of councillors have never heard of natural burial. They just don't know about it. And then one other thing, maybe you'll find it interesting. So I'll mention that we have on our radar um, to try and change is that the notion of grave renewal. As we go to different presentations, we ask people, what do you think about grave renewal? The idea that maybe after 80 years that when in natural burial, of course, there would be no remains that grave um, is opened and somebody else is able to go on it. It would mean that a cemetery is always sustainable. And people are, we have, we have got very little um, resistance to that idea. So given that our land is finite and we're all kind of in the mode of reuse and recycle, why not also graves? Um, so I will move on to questions, but I would just encourage you, please come and visit our website. It's got tons of answers about whatever your questions could be about natural burial. And if you sign up for our e-news, it only comes out twice a year, but it just helps us strengthen our voice when we go to the government and we'll say, we have this number of, of followers on Facebook and Instagram. We have this many people sign up for our e-news. And it just says to the government, okay, natural burial matters, matters to people. I'm gonna try and accommodate their wishes. So um, I hope that you'll visit our website. So, um, I hope that I'm able to talk with you. It would be hard if I can't, but I would took a stab at, at um, you know, thinking about what would be the next steps for Lion's Head. And this is tricky. Stuart's there. He might be the best one to, to continue on with that. But um, the discussion, I'm assuming it probably is going to be a hybrid. Like, you know, I spoke with, with um, Sault Ste. Marie group earlier today. And that is the stepping stone is to think about a hybrid. Um, and and the steps would be for those that are interested, you know, form a group, fo form natural burial line group of night lion's head or of Bruce Peninsula, and um, it's finding out who runs the local cemetery or cemeteries if there's more than one, and if they're private or if they're uh, with a religious affiliation, um, or if they're municipal. If they're municipal, then probably easier you can get the counselors involved and then and then certainly I can help you provide the ammunition to say what natural burial is and why it's why it's so in demand and how it will benefit the community and then I'll also keep this issue of winter burials um, on the radar but you know for instance there's a local advocacy group in Sarnia and there's a woman that runs a 
cemetery there. I believe it's private. And she's just like, no, I'm not interested in this. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to retire in a couple of years and then somebody else can do it. So, so it's a question of figuring out who can be the champions for the cause in your community and then just chipping away at all of the barriers so that it's made possible. And now if I can hear people, I could, I'd be happy to take on any questions, but I don't know. I see there's a chat. I don't know if I can, if I can hear it. Hi, Susan. Oh. Uh, so we're just gonna um, ask that you can read the questions out over the chat. And then when you're done with that, we can take questions in person uh, just to reduce the feedback because it's a hybrid session. Uh, is that okay? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Susan, have you approached land uh, conservancies about having natural bears on their protected habitat? There are several in the British Peninsula. That is such a good question. Yes. In, in, in fact, I am the Natural Burial Association is in a partnership opportunity right now with the Ontario Land Trust Association. And we're working with a group at Fleming College who is putting together a report for Ontario's land trusts to say, yes, this is a great opportunity. Now, conservation authorities and land trusts, they have charitable mandates, so they just can't suddenly get into the business of cemeteries. But they could open up their land to it because it checks all the similar boxes, right? Protecting the land and its natural eco-habitat, forming greater bonds between people and nature so the 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 the, the synergy between um the two is fantastic so yes it's on our radar and if you in your community have land trusts that you think would be interested in this absolutely reach out to them make sure that they're aware of this um and they're not going to run the cemetery but there could be a partnership and within a couple of months we'll have the report so that all their questions could be answered how what kind of um what are the pros and cons of what is done to the land what are the financial opportunities for them because the land trusts of course need to know that they're, that, that they'll have income um so that's all there is that the that might be the only question? Oh, somebody's asking Ontario Land Trust. So the association is called Ontario Land Trust Association, OLTA. Um, I suspect the trusts here are members of the Sunbrella Group. Yes, I, it's got hundreds and hundreds of members. So I would think it's across the province. Everybody's a member of um, uh, OLTA. Okay. So those are the questions in the chat. Um, I would like to say a huge thank you to Stuart Burgess, who has been working away at bringing a natural burial to your community for many years. I think as soon as I started this, um, he he was you know one of the first people that I that I came across. So, um, yay, Stuart! <laughs> My question had to do with uh, having uh, had a look at uh, the website of Natural Burial that they hand dug everything. Now. Uh, so our question was, how do you dig in a forest, which has, if you've ever even tried to transplant a tree, this big in the forest, it's very difficult to dig through the roots because there's multiple roots, multiple species. And uh, so there seemed to be a contradiction in what was said in Natural Burial website versus the answer we got, at least I got, or the one sitting close to the phone got, which is that they do use larger machines. So, I think that question needs to be sorted out because large machine is spilling oil, spilling gas, spilling, bringing weeds from all over the last place. Believe me, just a well driller comes in, they're going to make a mess because there's all kinds of weeds that come in. So that was my question. Thank you. Right. Okay. I think it was mute. It was a little bit convoluted, but I think I got it. Um, and in our, if it was our website, I think we might have, like, we don't say that one of the principles of natural burial is that the graves are hand dug. You might have seen in the, where we talk about the various natural burial grounds that exist, I might have, you, you would read about, say, the one in Coburg where they do hand dig. But we assume in Ontario that the majority, if not like 99% of all the um, cemeteries are going to require a backhoe. Um, so that is the first question. The second question was about um, the, 
uh, having a natural cemetery in a forest, which appeals to so many people. And as I mentioned earlier, it does exist in the woodland cemetery at um, the hybrid in Picton, Ontario. It means that the plots per acre are very, very minimal. I don't know, but they don't actually have a whole acre in Picton, so I couldn't say anyway, but they they um, went through and they got, like looked at the tree system and then just plotted out where the plots could be in, in respect to the distance from any tree in its root system. So they are more spare, sparse. Um, and the reality is that if you're gonna get a natural burial ground going hybrid or otherwise in the Bruce Peninsula, it would be a lot smarter to, to look for a meadowed area rather than woodland. Something that just came to mind actually because um, we were talking about land trusts earlier is the um, Escarpment Biosphere Conservancy. They're, 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 they're very keen on natural burial. So I'm just curious about if you did want to make a cemetery in a new place, where do you get the information about all the hoops you have to jump through in order to do that? Do you know? Oh, well, yes. And um, I mean, we have one preliminary page on our website on the resources page that just presents a big picture of what needs to be done. Um, the truth is it's not for the faint of heart. It's very complicated. First of all, you have to look at zoning. You have to look at the um, the water table, as you can imagine, is very important in cemeteries. And, and there's hydrology studies that are involved. There was a lot of money that it would be involved, even if the land is donated, getting the infrastructure together. Um, so it's a, and then the way that cemeteries are approved, um, aside from the obvious things, like one would need a cemetery license, that kind of thing, is that it starts with the municipality and they have to give their approval. And that is um, done, uh, if it's rezoning, then the, the council, all the councillors are involved. But if it's not rezoning, and it, then, it's, then it goes to the medical officer and he or she has to look at it from the, in terms of safety, that it's not too close to any body of water. Um, or that it's affecting the water table. So there's that process. And then once it's approved locally, then it goes on to um, the Bereavement Authority of Ontario. Um, Ontario happens to be the only province and I believe state in all of North America that has a regulatory body just for funerals and cemeteries. So it's, um, I mean, it's pretty, it's really bureaucratic. I mean, this whole thing, thing has kind of taught me how when it comes to starting a cemetery um you know Ontario is not a place of business it's not it's very very difficult to get it going there's everything in place to protect the status quo and, and a lot of barriers there to be honest a hybrid is a lot easier are there any other questions that's it that's it thanks okay. All right. Happy to answer any questions. Take care, everybody. And good luck. It is worth it. People will love the idea. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. And it's great that if you have some land trusts, reach out to the land trust because that could be good, too. Great. Thank you. Uh, hi. So um, about three years ago, uh, Ontario people, I thought I would be cremated because then I wouldn't have taken up any room and uh, it was probably a better way to go. I speak louder, okay. <laughs> and uh, then I started finding out about what happens in cremation and how much fuel is actually used to get the temperature that's needed to burn the body up. And also found out that not only are carbon toxins going into the air, but people who have had replacement parts in their body, like hip replacements, uh, what have you, those get ignited too. And so there's other toxic fumes that go into the air. Recently, I read that 
if you have a pacemaker, it has to be surgically removed before you can be cremated because the batteries can explode and damage the facility or the people that are working there. So it's definitely not uh, an equal kind of way to go. So then I thought about, well, I'll get buried then. But the idea of burial, uh, or not the burial, the makeup and the tucking tissues into my cheeks to make me look healthy, putting a nice tie and shirt on me and a little blazer and sticking me into a silk lined synthetic pale blue coffin <laughs> doesn't fit in with my lifestyle. So that's when I found out about natural burial and I got in touch with the Natural Burial Association. I did go, in, if, just a little overview, so council, our council has a cemetery committee looking after our cemeteries. And one of the, there are four volunteer people in there, a staff member and a council member. And one of the volunteers of the new committee is here, Mr. Milhausen. And uh, so I approached the previous uh, committee to give my little five minutes presentation saying, I'm, I don't represent anybody. I'm just interested for myself. I would like to be buried in a natural way. Can that happen? And uh, I was told, well, we talked about natural burial a while ago and nobody seemed interested, which to me was shocking because everybody that I talked to about natural burial said, wow, what, what is it? Or, Oh yeah, why, why don't we do that? Why, why don't we? So uh, I did partic participate in some of the conferences that the Natural Burial Association puts on by Zoom during COVID and found out that there are these little groups of people all over the province who are working, lobbying to try and get a natural burial facility. So the closest place that you can actually have a natural burial right now to us is in Owen Sound. There's a cemetery called Greenwood Cemetery. They have a Jewish section, a Muslim section, and a small natural burial section. Jews and Muslims have to be buried very quickly after death. So there's no embalming involved. And the natural burial site uh, I think they had nine graves. I don't know what's happening there. There's a, a woman who runs the cemetery. I contacted her and they said, what about winter burials? And she said, we can bury you anytime. We have snow blowers. We have backhoes. And I said, shit, we don't have one of those up here. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I thought, why don't we lobby and see if we can get something happening here. So <clears throat> during my bits of research, I found out in Canada, in Ontario, there are several that are hybrid uh, cemeteries. In Denman Island, which was not referred to here, they referred to Salt Spring Island. Denman Island has a new cemetery being developed and it's going to have 1,000 sites. Two young women have designed it. It's pretty neat. Uh, they don't want equipment driving over graves. So what they do is they arrange it in a kind of rows and the outside ones get filled up first so that equipment can go over the other sites and they progressively fill in. One of the other things that I decided to do after consultation with some of my friends is uh, get a survey organized, which we put on social media and we also put in the newspaper. And uh, Stephen Waller put it, uh, put it together through uh, Survey Monkey. And uh, we just got the results. The survey ended yesterday. 
and 161 people submitted the survey. And I, I won't do all the details of it. Let's just say, would you like to see one of the questions? Would you like to see a natural burial as an option on Bruce Peninsula? 94.8% of those people said yes. Hear me, Mr. Milhouse. <laughs> that was 146 people. So that, that's an indication that there is certainly an interest in something happening here. What we need to do next is have a natural burial group. We're going to be investigating and lobbying a bit more of what we have here. Because I personally don't know how many how many sites, how many more people can be buried on, on the Ruth Peninsula in the existing cemetery. I, I really have no idea. Can they expand? They can appropriate that. They can, they can appropriate. They can appropriate. Okay. Well, that may be what's needed because uh, <laughs> who knows? I, I, again. Um, 75% of the people who filled out the survey are over the age of 55. 48% uh, were over 65, but didn't have an over 75, so I, I slipped in between the cracks. <laughs> so that's a large portion, we, know, we all know that, of people who live here who are senior. So uh, I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, I'm open to being involved for sure. And if anybody wants to come and see me afterwards and say, well, I'd like to, to let's, yeah. let's see what we can do, but what's the next step? And we'll take it from there. As a little aside, this has always been a very sort of delicate topic, talking about death and dying. And uh, it's something that as a society, I think we have to work on. And my friend, Matthew Bailey Dick, is trying to organize a death cafe. Death cafes are a movement in the world where people get together, have a coffee, have a family or nothing, and sit and talk about death and dying. Because we, we should be celebrating death as we celebrate birth. It's not a big deal. We owe, we owe the planet one death. That's all we have to do. Taxes and death. Can't get away from it. And so that's it for me. Um, is there any question or discussion that you want to have for, on this subject? I don't know. Stuart could have any more information for us, but um, yes. well, I, I was just wondering, you know, in traditional cemeteries, you can go and buy a plot ahead of time. Is that what happens in Greenland? Yeah, that can that can that can happen in, in a hybrid cemetery and a natural burial site. If I mean these are these are things that have to be worked out. This is all sort of new, even though it's really old. And uh, I was talking to Jenna. I mean, there are hundreds, hundreds of natural burial places up here because First Nations people all buried naturally. Early pioneers were all buried naturally. Uh, Jenna knows more about some of the sites that are up here that are children's cemeteries. Uh, they're not necessarily marked out in. Um, some of them are not, and some of them are not very subtle. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the details, the planning, uh, I told you about the place in Owen Sound, where the, the group there has actually gone to council, and council hired an architect, and they've actually got it now, the design that will be an expense, a more expansive kind of natural building. And Mary, every cemetery has its own uh, rules and regulations, shall we say? So they all can be a little bit different. I mean, if you're if you're interested in being with the best, thing would be to get in touch with them and just ask them what what's going on there. Yeah. Uh, so did you, in looking into this, did you run into 
the idea of, of composting. Yep. And uh, can you talk a little bit about what you thought of that versus what's being proposed by natural burial? Because it is a sense of natural burial, but it, yep. if I understood it correctly, it requires much more infrastructure with yep. natural burial avoids. But I'm not sure what happens to the remains after composting, which was usually wood chips. Well, <clears throat> I think the only composting facility is in Oregon or California, you know, California people. And it's a young woman who uh, organized it. And it is a building, <clears throat> and you go in the top, and yeah. you are recycled. All yeah, and down. all the way down, and when it's come to the bottom, it's a tray full of compost that can be sprinkled up. Uh, Mr. Milhausen is, is a farmer, and farmers compost uh, wastes that yeah. uh, die. Uh, that's how they're looked takes, after. It takes nine months to decompose a cow, including all the bones, right? Yeah. But I'm wondering if uh, you could combine the two, or if there's any work done on combining the two ideas, composting and natural burial, mm -hmm. because to me, they both have distinct advantages in by coming together, you can, yeah. I'm wondering if you could do Did you come across the mycelium casket? I read something about that. Mushroom caskets. Uh -huh. Yeah, mushroom uh -huh. caskets, yeah. There's uh, woven baskets. Uh, they're, you can even be buried in a cardboard box. Uh, they're making cardboard caskets. Uh, the ideal casket has no nails in it. Yeah, you use dowels? Dowels, dowels, are dowels, dowels yeah. It yeah. In, there's, there's all, the all those things can be worked out. And, and same with winter burials, as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't understand why we can't dig a hole in the summertime. <laughs> and, <laughs> Fill it with wood chips or whatever and make them up when somebody dies. I mean, there's ways around. Len, would you like to talk about your personal experiences with cemeteries? <laughs> <laughs> um, only that my, uh, my wife is a brother lives in North Carolina and had this as a challenge. The way he got around all the paperwork is churches can do whatever they want. And of course, you don't really have to say what. You know, your spiritual philosophy. Your spiritual philosophy because of freedom of religion in the U.S. So they basically set up a little church for you. Oh. They put down nine graves now. Just on the little farms. Wow. This would so, bring a lot of people back to church. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing is, you told me once that because he's a church, he can accept donations. <laughs> Something like that. The composting place in the States, I don't know if anybody else has seen, but it's very elaborate, it's very, very high-end looking, and it seems so ridiculous to me that, you know, it's a, it's a simple, natural process, and they've made it very expensive. Mm -hmm. And then there's there's also, which I never had heard of until a couple months ago, there's also water. It's an alkyd water. water um, what, uh, hydrolysis? No, 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 no. Well, it's like that. It's, it's, well, like, it's like a like cremation. It's like a cremation, cremation, but with, with, with water. water. Yeah. And uh, at the end process, they turn on a tap and you flow it. No, they. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. 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 Travis, yeah. Yeah. Is that, that's that happening over there? Yeah. Oh, I, think uh, I don't know, but yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. You're being told, you know, that if my son wasn't buried in Cotton, that it was just to be an interesting thing. Yeah. That's what the senator is. And I was just And how many things took in the way Yeah. of doing something. Yeah. Well, because it's an industry now, I was talking to a friend of mine last week, and he said uh, when his father died, he and his brother went to the funeral parlor, 
to look for coffins. And <clears throat> they looked around the, well, the big selection of coffins. And there was a plain wooden one for $1,600. And the manager of the facility said, but it's your dad. <laughs> you have anything less? There's a place in Maine, Ontario, in eastern Ontario, that makes these coffins very simple. I don't know what kind of fastener they use. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I think it's mentioned in the website. Yeah. If someone needs. Yes, Ken. One, um, I've been like really interested in either coming to wherever you for a very long time because um, it makes sense in a way. But one thing that's, I think I just have a really selfish uh, concern about it in that because green burials are so rare currently in Ontario um, and because there's an industry, I have concerns that one thing we should think about as we see forward is the I feel like the plots can get sold out real quickly by people not coming to the site. Does that make sense? Because, you know, like folks well, say, I think there's one at uh, one long cemetery, maybe the plots as well. And so I was thinking, like, there'd be people like me researching this and be like, oh, well, all I can do is well, I guess I'll buy in there. Mm -hmm. But I'm not from there. So I'm kind of interested in, like, commodification yeah. of green cemeteries because of how rare they are and protecting ourselves from that. Industry part of it, which is maybe how if the municipality was doing it, that might be one of the, mm -hmm. the methods around that. But that's just something I wanted to mention that I wasn't concerned about. Is I don't want because they're so rare, I don't want us having one to become a, a new kind of tourism destination. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the financial people are dying to get there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that way, the, the, the council could make sure your taxes were. Density at this particular cemetery is approximately 300 burials per acre, as opposed to 1,000 in a traditional. Area. And the, the thing about you know burying in the forest and she advised to put in metal, but you can bring that metal into the forest. Yeah. Well, just simply planting yeah. trees and getting them. Well, great. The, this, this particular um, cemetery in uh, Vermont, uh, they, they allow the family to plant uh, one tree, one shrub, and wildflowers. It has to be indigenous, it has to be from the area, nothing, nothing is imported. Uh, and what they do is um, each plot is six feet by 12 feet. The hole going somewhere in the middle, <clears throat> and then they they take them four feet deep. They're not as deep as like six feet under size, and they put um, wood chips um, or leaves or grass clippings, anything organic to sort of stimulate and oxygenate the area. And when they take the soil off, when they're digging it, they take it in layers and separate them so that they go back the same way, so that the microbes are just very little as possible. And every word is 
<laughs> that's right. That's right. All arms were harmed during the excavation of this site. My question is who is on the cemetery committee with Jamie? Jamie, Milt uh, McKeever is the uh, council rep. I don't know the other people. They're from. No way, really. Yeah. Oh, Sorry. Okay. We're not funded yet. All right. The next month, I think you're actually uh, official. Is that the same guy who was the uh, CAO here? Uh, he was. Oh, he's, he's, next, right? he's uh, sort of the Hazel. <laughs> <laughs> that I, I did invite uh, Steve Rogers from George Funeral Home who used to live up here um, because I had been in touch with him before when I when I heard about Greenwood having a natural burial I, I called him and I said well <clears throat> how do I get there and he said I'll take you down I said well what if I want to make my own coffin I'll, I'll just transport you I, I'm okay with that so I think uh, they will have to become open to natural if business. If, yeah, if they want to stay in business because people are wising up, but they, well, lots of people don't want that, the alternatives. There's also, uh, I think, some kind of a clause where by, if you don't utilize all of the services that you pay for, like in my case or in my mother's case, uh, you do that to be in business. And it could be that there may be some holdback of that, but I think it would be worth asking. Yeah. The people that you're dealing with, if it's all right, you know, if you trust the church, who do you think they'll go? And to be honest, it's still a fact that it'll have to be fun for me. Well, you can say it now. Yeah, so I can. Oh, I can see it now. I have to agree with it. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. would I'm wondering I'm wondering if in your research if you found anything around alternatives to it seems it seems like the the options are cremation or being buried. But what if you don't mind the scavengers leaving? And you, like is that legal to be, you know, somewhere in a private lot laying that cremation? Yeah, well, you know, we think about that. We, we think about that too. I mean, we've got, we've got four acres when I just, there's crevices of it. Show me down in there. So I think, I think it's against the law. You know, there's, there's lots of things that, that I'm finding out. Like, what happens when you die? You have to be authentically identified by a doctor that you are dead. So he signs a, he or she signs a death certificate. After that, the family can take the body from the hospital or the morgue or wherever. The family can take the, the, the corpse home. They can wash it, they can dress it, they can wrap it in a shroud or whatever. What happens after that, I don't know. I don't know. I think you have to be in a cemetery. Or something from the excuse me, where is the body? Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, there is a scavenger's grave option um, whereby, like, there's like laboratories and forensic places where you can, like, donate your body to science and it's like a decomposition study um, where they see, like, how bodies end up kind of in those situations. So, um, if you a science experiment, they can be like, eaten by scavengers, you know, like, 
The municipality owns all the cemeteries in the northern Bruce Peninsula. Does the municipality own all the cemeteries? As far as I know, they do, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, in which case, how open, or I don't know, like, what's the reception to the idea of uh, national burial? I know it's a relatively new council now, but do you have a sense of what, or maybe things? <laughs> no, no, but next month, Mr. Yeah. Milhausen will be taking his report to the, the cemetery committee. I but hope. The, I probably missed some of the challenges of how it is to set it up, but what's to stop us from just rezoning 
any property or just part of, or even just allowing you to designate an area of your property for cemetery. Mm -hmm. Never gonna happen? Mm -hmm. so we have to go through all those. Remember I asked her how many you have to dump their weather boots? It's a lot. It's a lot yeah. of red tape to, to designate an yeah. area. We have talked to people, Bruce Trail people and the Scotland Biosphere people. Yeah, they're both open to, yeah, it would be an idea, maybe not on the trail, so people want to be <laughs> but nearby. And uh, sure, we'll get you some land. There is, there's land in trust all over the area here, but to section off an area and call it a cemetery is a lot of expense and a lot of red tape. It's just not simple. Did you have, were you scratching your head, Jenna? Or? This was probably an uh, unprecedented example of like deciding on the site as well because they, the, the nut spray and the soap spray in this location are almost 100% sand. And so I'm not sure these are ever be allowed there because of the drinking pattern. Um, a lot of places are very carsick, so I'm not sure you're allowed there. And these are carsick. But like Easter, you have like clay plain. So I think that would be a really Spot, yeah. but nowhere else in Ontario would be so landscape because of the fact that like 100% sandbox, a lot of parks, yeah. um, not a lot of like slow that's still, that's one of the like other considerations. It's adding to the landscape. Well, it's not, it's not easy, it's not just sandal, it's just no, I don't think it's land, land. Yeah. yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What is your um, wish? Is there a committee? Is it? Is there an organizing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be. I mean, this is stage one. Like, uh, let's get a group of interested people. I mean. We've done a survey, we know there's people interested, so. Yeah. So, sign right here. Yeah, you can do that, or you can get in touch with me. You have my email number. Here, here's the book. Okay, okay, sure. Let's, uh, sorry. Abandon ship. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Thanks Shout out to the coming techie. Up. Oh, God. Thank you.